Limited Dealer at Sensi Dr. Jose Ramos Horta, President of Timor Leste and Nobel Peace Prize <coughs> Laureate. Respected Your Excellency Dr. Paul Pei, Senior Minister of the Royal Government of Cambodia, Vice Chairman of the Supreme National Council for Education of Cambodia, and PUC Founding Father and Chairman of the PUC Board of Trustees. Respected Your Excellency, Madams, National and International Business Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, on these occasions of the dinner receptions, graciously hosted by Panya Sastra University of Cambodia in honor of His Excellency Dr. Jose Ramos Horta, President of Timor Leste and Nobel Peace Prize Laureate. The artists of the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts have the great honor to present this evening a cultural program beginning with the Apsara dance. In Khmer mythology, all Apsara were born for from the form surface of the oceans of milk, where the heavenly begin, Devoda, and Demon, Asura, churn the ocean of milk with a gigantic naga, in search for Tuk Amrit, or the elixir of immortality. The dead portray Mira, dressed in white for purity, dancing in her garden. She is joined by her handmaid, also Apsara, who produced flower, which expressed great love of the people and nations. Your Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Apsara Dance. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
which make up one of the main agricultural resources of the country. Inspired by nature, the artists of the Royal University of Fine Art created the coconut shell dam, which is now going to be presented. Your Excellency, Dr. Thiel, business guest, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Coconut Shell Dam. <laughs>
Ramos Falta and Dr. Paul Tate handing forward to the state to present flower to all our artists. Your Excellency, 
Excellency Dr. Jose Ramos Hota, President of Timor Leste, Honorable Peace Prize Laureate, Your Excellency, Madam, Distinguished Diplomatic Corps, National and International Honored Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Faculties, Member, and Students Assembly. First and foremost, on behalf of the PUC community, we have immense pleasure and honor to host His Excellency Dr. Jose Ramos Porta, President of Timor Leste and the 1996 Nobel Peace Prize laureate, as our distinguished keynote speaker today. Today, we are delighted to have this auspicious occasion and opportunity to hear his peace striving experience for Timor Leste. I feel very honored and profoundly grateful for his kindness in coming to share with us his invaluable experience in peacemaking at our university. Please allow me to briefly mention a little bit about our Panyasastra University and we call it PUC. Since its perception, since its inception, PUC commit itself to the promotion of world peace where peaceful solutions are encouraged to find answers to all forms of conflict. That's the reason why we established at our university a peace and conflict study institute, which include five countries as members of this institute. The program was initiated and first sponsored by the government of Japan. PUC firmly believe that it is through education that people can live in peace and harmony with one another. According to the Lord Buddha, war or conflict come from nowhere but human nature. And mind defilement which are greed, hatred, and ignorance. These three evil thoughts manifest themselves in bodily, verbal, and mental action. They are the root causes of all war and conflict. Therefore, it is man who create world war or world peace. With this belief in that, PUC has been keen to promote peace starting from individuals, this creates an idea that when there is inward peace in individuals, it contributes to peace in family. When every family is at peace, the community is peaceful. When the community is peaceful, it assures the peace in society. When a society is peaceful, it leads to peace in a nation. When a nation is peaceful, it brings about peace in a region. When the region, when the whole region of the world is peaceful, the whole world will enjoy and live in peace and harmony. Peace begins in our heart and mind. The same concept is shared by the preamble of UNESCO, which states that since war begins in the mind of man, peace can be likewise be constructed in the mind of man. Man is more complex than animal, where his uniqueness lies in his potential to overcome ignorance, to overcome greed, to overcome anger. And experience 
and exercise perfect knowledge and wisdom. Therefore, the main objective of education at PUC is freedom from all forms of bondage, material, and spiritual. To concretize the goal of freedom and to promote peace, and in the all has to use this his cognitive and its full potential with his or her own effort, keeping oneself strictly to the path of freedom, the path is comprised of the three stages, which can be seen in our PUC motto, Sela, Samadhi, and Panya, meaning high morality, inside meditation, or concentration and wisdom. Students at PUC have to undergo a rigorous training in moral behavior, training their mind on essential things and con controlling their body and mind properly, making them experience wisdom. This form an integrated whole and are not merely theory but the practical way of life. The process of living leading to the goal of freedom. Peace cannot happen in this world without the practice of tolerance. To be tolerant, we must overcome anger and grief as our Buddha teaches us. No envy can harm one so much as one's own thought of craving. Hate and jealousies. I hope that today historical gathering at TUC will contribute the shared experience and our common goal in fostering world peace and solidarity for the benefit and happiness of all sentient beings in the planet. In closing, I would like to leave you with this humble thought. Man has forgetting that he has the heart. He forget that if he treat the world kindly, the world will treat him kindly in return. My old being be always happy. Thank you so much for your attention. for your warm welcome remark. And now we are going to hear an overview of the third ASEAN's event series, Bridges Dialogue Toward a Culture of Peace. Please allow me to introduce the speaker, Mr. Owe Modavets. Mr. Owe Modavets is an artist, promoter, networker, facilitator, and producer, and the founder and chairman of the board of director of the International Peace Foundation a non-political independent foundation under the patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Owe Modavets. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Welcome to the third ASEAN event series, Bridges, Dialogues to the Passion. Bridges is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, a non-political and non-religious foundation, under the patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates, including His Excellency President Dr. Hussein Aswata, based in Vienna. The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners and institutions, including the country's major universities, and I would like to thank the Anastasia University of Cambodia for hosting our event today. Since November last year, more than 50 British events with a total audience of 20,000 participants, mostly students, have been continuously held in Cambodia until today, involving the participation of Nobel laureates in peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics, as well as other keynote speakers and artists, including Hong Kong actor Jackie Chan, Hollywood film director Oliver Stone, and world-renowned pianist 
The third ASEAN series of bridges is an independent contribution to the decade for culture of peace and nonviolence, which was initiated by the United Nations General Assembly. It follows a series of 350 bridges events, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand, the Philippines, and Malaysia since 2003. 39 Nobel laureates, as well as 18 other keynote speakers and artists, including Dr. Hans Fix, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, Vanessa May, Jesse Norman, the late Dame Anita Roddick, and Dr. James Wolfenson participated in these events. In Thailand, they were presided by Her Majesty Queen Sirikit, and Her Royal Highness Princess Mahachakri Sirikon, and they reached an audience of 120,000 participants. This piece cannot be achieved instantly, but is a process which needs time. Bridges has not been organized as one single conference, and then everything is over again and forgotten. But as an ongoing series of events in which Nobel laureates and international decision makers have built strong bridges with the leaders in all parts of society and with the general public. With the basis for peace being education, and synergies being the fruit of cooperation, the International Peace Foundation has not realized bridges alone, but has carried out the program together with UNESCO and 112 other national and international institutions including 53 major universities and schools. The multidisciplinary and pluralistic approach of bridges in Thailand, the Philippines, and Malaysia, and of the events in Cambodia, reflects that peace involves all parts of society. It involves awareness and social responsibility of politicians, the business community, scientists, artists, and the media. And since peace within ourselves, our families, and our environment, starts in our minds and hearts, it involves every one of us. In this sense, Bridges challenges us to cross borders and to build bridges by listening and opening up to other viewpoints, by generating new thoughts, by developing innovative forms of cooperation, and by fulfilling the desire of everyone to get to know and to learn from each other. This can lead us to a world in which we will be able to understand each other and the complexities we face today in a new light. The globalized world needs broad strategies for change, for a sustainable future, for us and the next generations. So let us be inspired by the knowledge and wisdom that Bridges continues to offer, an opportunity to get a more inclusive, interconnected, and comprehensive view of ourselves and of the world in which we live in in which we are able to create a new constant through dialogues towards actual peace, which need the participation of As the Bridges series now comes to its close in Cambodia and will be continued in the years ahead in other ASEAN countries such as Vietnam, Indonesia, Laos, and Brunei, I thank His Excellency Dr. Jose Ramoswata, the Nobel Peace Laureate and President of the Democratic Lester, who has agreed to come to Cambodia to support the events. We now look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. Welcome, Your Excellency, Dr. Jose Kramsky.
to share with you some uh, facts about the situation today in Macau because it's actually fitting with the idea of promoting cultural peace and uh, non violence in the world. Today, uh, we are at peace with uh, robust economic growth for the last three years, average double digit growth, but still with enormous challenges in uh, modernizing our administration, making it functional, responsive to the needs of the people, delivering basic services to rural areas, improving the performance of the government, the ministries, strengthening the judiciary, rule of law, modernizing our small police force and defense force, make them sensitive and responsive, responsive to the people. All these are part of the lengthy growth of nation building and state building. But at the same time, as we undertake this task for the past seven, eight years, since transfer of sovereignty from the United Nations to the Timorese authorities in 2002, we have had also to deal with healing the wounds in the country among divided individuals or divided communities in the previous 24 years, but also normalizing relations with the Republic of Indonesia. So you can imagine the monumental uh, challenge and task that was uh, that we inherited. Eight years in the life of uh, a family, a university, is very short. Eight years in the life of a country, a nation state, is even short. So for this, we beg uh, uh, understanding for our shortcomings. But Timor-Leste today is at peace, strong, robust economic growth, and actually if you look at the uh, economist booklet, the pocketbook of 2010, you will see that we have the highest surplus budget against GDP in the world almost 300% surplus. Second is Libya, 30% So we are, but that is uh, derived from oil and gas revenues that fortunately by design of God was uh, given to us on the day when we exceeded independence in 2002. In two, May 20, 2002, the very first day of independence, we signed a historical agreement with Australia in uh, revenue sharing of one major gas and oil field called Bayunda, whereby we get 90% of the downstream revenues and Australia 10% of the revenues. In 2002, our budget the budget that was managed by the first government. I don't know the budget of this university, but I know the budget of many other universities around the world, in the United States, in Australia. Yes, that our budget was much smaller, many times smaller than our university budget for us. Our budget was $68 million. It was with $68 million that uh, the Prime Minister at the time and his cabinet, I was foreign minister, had to meet the, even the modest expectations of the people. Because sometimes we hear academic, uh, journalistic uh, jargon talking about high expectations of the people in the post independence. Actually, the people don't have a high expectations. They ask for clean water. They ask access to school, medical care, maybe electricity, maybe transportation, 
these are not high expectations. These are modest and normal. But what was heartbreaking is that even these very modest expectations, we wouldn't be able, we were not able to meet with $68 million budget. In 2004, 2005, oil revenues began to come in, but still slow, modest. And only by 2006, 2007, oil price went up, and suddenly our uh, petroleum fund, which was created in 2004, 2005, which we were expected to reach a few billion dollars in 20 years, in only five years, it reached what we thought we would reach in 20 years. It is with this uh, budget from oil, mostly from oil and gas revenues, that we attempt to finance the building of infrastructures, roads, bridges, a new port, airport, improving, modernizing our agriculture to ensure food security, but also doing what I always argue. A few years ago, I was telling the then Prime Minister, he was pleased with how our petroleum fund was getting fatter and fatter. But I said, as our petroleum fund get fatter because of the increased oil price, commodities, other commodities also go up in the cost, People start feeling the cost of an increased oil price, and you must find a way to transfer some of this cash into the pockets of the people. At the time when I argue for direct cash transfer to the poor, it sounded like a heresy. At least some international multilateral institutions would not agree with that doesn't sound good economics. But this is what we began to do in 2008. In 2008, we began to transfer every month $20, but payable every six months, to every person over the age 60, every handicapped or vulnerable person on top of widows and orphans. This year, this money went up to $30. My argument at the time was that not only this was a moral obligation on our part, but it would make sense economically. My argument was that we could, it was immoral to let our petroleum fund manage in New York by a fund manager in U.S. Treasury bonds, safe, no doubt, average, uh, modest, but good interest paid into the account from the investment in U.S. Treasury bonds. But we needed to do much more than that. Our law required us to use only 3% of the revenues from the investment of the petroleum fund in U.S. Treasury bonds. The law does not allow us to spend more than that unless the government is able to present to the parliament specific concrete projects to be funded by the petroleum fund above the 3%. I propose that we could make good economics by transferring cash to the people. My argument was, if we give $20, $30, that was argued for more, I argued for $40 to $50 a month for over uh, anyone over the age 55, which was consistent with uh, our life expectancy, which today is close to 60. But it, the parliament, the government agreed, 60 years and $20 and now $30. My argument was, if you give $30 to a poor lady, barefoot. She is not going to immediately rush to Bali, to Singapore, to do duty-free shopping, to buy lipsticks and expensive perfumes. 
they would immediately spend the money in buying more vegetables, eggs, chicken in their communities. So money would be injected into the local rural economy. And this is what happening. Tens of thousands of people who never saw money in their lives suddenly began to uh, receive $30 a month. And I commend my government for the extraordinary effort they did in only a few months involving community leaders, district administrators, they were able to identify people around the country and deliver the money. I travel extensively throughout the country, constantly. I stop along the way when, whenever I see an elderly person, lady, walking down the dirt road. I ask, mother, that's how in Timor we treat an older person, father or mother. Mother, are you receiving that $30 from the government? Almost all of them say yes. And I ask, and what do you do with it? She would say, I buy some kalen. Kalen is a Timorese word for uh, corrugated iron to fix my home. Or I buy some extra rice for my grandchildren. These are all efforts that we make to uh, rebuild the country, to bring peace to the country after 24 years of occupation. And then following occupation, our own internal uh, problems. Healing the wounds among the divided communities. Healing the wounds within our defense force, between the defense force and the police. The road to peace, I have a, a TV program called The Road to Peace and National Unity. It's a monthly program, pre-recorded anywhere in a remote village, engaging hundreds of people in dialogue. And today I'm pleased to say that the program is almost like an utter failure. Because the theme is the road to peace and national unity. People are supposed to engage with me in discussions about the notion of peace and unity. They are supposed to give me ideas. I give them ideas about how to promote peace. The moderator attempts to lead the people towards the thing, but zero question coming from the audience or comment about peace and national unity. What do they ask? They tell Mr. President, Father President, how about a road to my village instead of road to peace? <laughs> and we are at peace here. So what they're talking about? We want a road here. We want water. We want electricity. We want schools. So I've been doing this program now for well over a year. And still not one single question has come to me about how to promote peace. But this is positive because two years ago, wherever I spoke in the parliament, in the villages, all the questions were, when are you going to bring security to us? When are you going to put police here? When are you going to send the army here? Why the United Nations police is not here? Today, not a single question deal with that. But this does not mean that peace has been consolidated in the country. It is much longer the road than this. People with no patience, people who are always in a hurry, or who do not have time to listen, to sit down and listen to the common people, to the youth, they are not destined, they are not, they don't have the vocation to build peace. In countries, particularly post-conflict, where there is trauma, there is wounds that you don't see in the body, but you can see in the eyes, in the face, you can see in the soul, it requires much more sensitivity, patience to heal. My program is very therapeutic in this regard. But also I work with youth in the communities. Over a year ago, we launched a program called Dili City of Peace. And where did I launch it? I didn't launch it in a workshop 
hosted by the United Nations. I did a launch it in an international conference. I launched it in a place called Bekora, one of the more problematic neighborhood of Dili, the capital. And who were the audience? Not academics, not diplomats, or government officials. They were people mostly barefoot, unshaven, unclean, members of gangs, martial arts groups, and of course some student leaders as well. I put a simple challenge to them. We will build a city of peace, but it will be you who will build this city of peace, because this city is more yours than mine. I live comfortably. I have a security. It is you who have to build peace from within your neighborhoods. But it is, you cannot build peace only with speeches as inspiring as they may be. You have also to address some of the basic needs of the poor, because some root causes of, poverty, of violence has to do with poverty, with land dispute, with housing dispute, with the feeling of alienation and dispossession. So, part of the program, I challenge the youth in the neighborhood who used to fight each other and they often burn their rival homes. I challenge them to build homes for the poorest in the neighborhood. I said, I will not decide who will be the poorest. You will identify. I give you the building material and cash to build a home. And that's what they did. We have built dozens of homes in the poorest neighborhood. It is these gangs, these individuals who built. Very simple. Each house costs $2,000. And what was the definition of the poorest person? The definition is, I told them my definition, which they agreed. Someone who sleep under the stars. He watched, look at the stars every evening. Might sound romantic, but can be uncomfortable. When he trained, and sleep on the wet dirt floor. But they were the ones who identify the poorest. And on top of this, together with the government, we try to improve the lives of the people throughout the country. And this is what leadership is all about. And this is part of peace building, peace making. It cannot be only workshops, conferences. We, in each of our own society, you students in Cambodia, wherever you, wherever you live, you can build peace in your communities. First, within your homes, there cannot be domestic violence in our midst. A home has to be the most safe, the safest. A child or a mother cannot feel unsafe in their own home. The road to the school must be the safest. The school has to be the safest. And when the child listens to the bell ringing, time to go home, he, must, he or she must be excited in going home. Because some children are scared of going home. Because home is hell. And this is not all still. We must also show compassion to the poorest in our neighborhoods. I asked the audience at the time, when I launched the campaign, whether any of them had ever helped a blind person crossing the street. Whether they ever invited a very poor old man sitting on the road into their home offering a meal. This, this is what peace is all about. Has to do with humanity, has to do with compassion, with solidarity. Peace is not an abstract concept. It's not only absence of war, absence of violence. Peace has to do also with us showing understanding towards what in many communities called illegal migrants. 
You might be surprised to hear that poor East Timor now also has many illegal migrants. And I always use the word illegal in uh, quotes because I don't like the word illegal. Calling on a human being, you are illegal. What does that supposed to mean? Illegal on this planet? I know, illegal in my country, we have immigration laws and all of that. We have uh, migrants, illegal, from Bangladesh, from China, from mainland China, from Indonesia, the largest numbers, and even some all the way from Africa, from Nigeria particularly. As I drive sometimes around town, I see some uh, faces that easily recognizable as from Bangladesh. And who they are? They are already building a shop, usually furnished shop, some restaurants, and I think of the extraordinary contributions of migrants throughout history. The U.S. is what it is today, thanks to migrants, first from all over Europe and then from the rest of the world. As I lived in the United States and tra traveled throughout the U.S. over the years, some 30 years ago, some of the most uh, startling encounters that I, I had was going from one place to another, like going to one of the most famous hospitals in Boston, the Eye and Ear Hospital in Boston, and who was the chief surgeon in that hospital. I thought I was going to meet an elderly person, Anglo-Saxon, blonde, blue eyes. It was an Indian in his 30s. I just remember his name was Dr. Thomas. Very good looking, young, in his 30s. He was the chief surgeon in that prestigious university. And there many more experiences like that throughout the United States. This, and I tell you, if today Guatemalans, El Salvadorians, Mexicans were to stop working in Los Angeles, particularly the ladies in Los Angeles would not, would not know what to do with their lives. Los Angeles would paralyze. And that means we are in a globalized world where each individuals, individuals, communities perform functions that are necessary to keep this engine going around the world. In Australia, about 10 years or 15 years ago, maybe 10 years, I was in Melbourne and met with the then new mayor of Melbourne. I was pleasantly surprised to meet the new mayor. He was ethnic Chinese, first generation post Yemen, speaking English with Chinese accent. 20 years earlier, he would never have been elected mayor anywhere in Australia. The society changed in Australia. And they were able to elect in that very big city an ethnic Chinese as mayor. And this I explained to my people in the neighborhood to counter some of the rumblings about illegal migrants. I tell them, illegal migrants don't take jobs away from anyone. Don't believe in this propaganda. They invent, they make up jobs for themselves. They create jobs. And this is all part of the culture of peace. Because if you do not have a tolerance, respect towards an unknown person from somewhere in the world coming to your country, do you really have the sentiments, feelings, commitment to building peace? Can there be reconciliation in your proclamation of peace, but at the same time say, yes, peace, but not with these people from elsewhere? So this is what I explain in my own country. Now moving to uh, maybe a bigger picture, although I believe what I say might be more or less applicable in most uh, situations. Uh, I end my uh, remarks here today with uh, the challenges that Asia face. 
this is a follow-up of some remark, a speech I made in uh, Singapore, December 17, at this Institute of Strategic and Defense Studies. I don't remember even the exact title, but it was something along the lines, Challenges and Opportunities for Asia. While undoubtedly Asia today offers the greatest promises. It has almost 50% of the world population, the largest concentration of wealth. It also has 60% of the world's poor. But it also it is also one of the most dangerous regions of the world. The most nuclearized region of the world is Asia. Pakistan, India, North Korea, China, not to mention those with aspiration to have a bomb in our Asia region. And on top of this, you have a historical, deep-seated, some decades-old border disputes that open, often have flared up into open warfare between neighbors. And then you have some religious extremism that translate into violence, in, not only in Asia, but from Asia gone elsewhere to Europe and the United States. So we have a combustion of wealth, disparity, extreme poverty, religious extremism, and nuclear weapons. When uh, President Barack Obama gave a speech in New York in September on nuclear, uh, a nuclear-free wall, I met with him uh, in the course of those days twice, brief uh, social uh, encounters. And I, as I was sitting in the Security Council chamber, listening to that very inspiring, eloquent speech, my mind veered towards the borders of Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, North Korea. And I thought, what a task he has thrust on himself. That evening, even though I was very sick, I had bronchitis, the doctor had diagnosed me with bronchitis, but because I had gone to New York, paid a ticket to go to New York, and uh, I stayed in a very cheap hotel because I refused to pay the horrendous prices that New York hotels impose on presidents and prime ministers. <laughs> During the General Assembly, I stayed in a single room, and I said, I'm not going to, I'm paying $400 a night, must be the cheapest here for any head of state, and uh, you stay in the room. It would make, make no sense. So I kept on going to the UN. Maybe in the process I passed on my bronchitis to a few people. <laughs> At least my US Secret Services, they all got my bronchitis because after two days I saw all of them coughing. <laughs> <laughs> and I was embarrassed. I wouldn't look at them in their faces. But they were very polite, they wouldn't say anything. And, but I, when I met with President Barack Obama, I said, President, you cannot fail. He looked at me and said, we will work together. I haste to clarify that he, that he did not mean working together with me, you know, little me, but he meant in his uh, very, very, uh, how you say, uh, typical approach, in, the, in the developing partnerships with countries around the world. It is with this partnership between the powers that be that maybe some of the vaccine issues that affect Asia for so many decades may be resolved or reduced in their seriousness, gravity, and intensity. This month, coming month, uh, May, 
the United Nations will hold a so-called conference review of the non-proliferation treaty. There was a meeting in Washington a few weeks ago of 40 nuclear powers. Will President Barack Obama succeed in his vision to force partnerships to address some of these global challenges? Well, he will succeed if Asian leaders live up to our own responsibilities. 50% of the world population is here, 60% of the world wars, the greatest concentration of nuclear weapons. Because of the huge demographics that present Asia with great opportunities, but also with great challenges, it is also our responsibility. And it is on the issue of climate change that I believe Asia can take center stage and lead. This is what I have discussed with another little country, the president of Maldives, Nashi. I don't know if in uh, Cambodia you people know much about Maldives. A bit over 1,000 islands, 200 of which inhabited, absolute paradise. I went there by coincidence on uh, Valentine's Day. <laughs> well, it was pure coincidence. Uh, I asked to see the better Nasheed of Maldives, Persian, and he agreed on Valentine's Day. He didn't know what was, it was Valentine's Day. But the very cynical media in my country immediately speculated that why he go to Maldives on Valentine's Day. Well, my companion was our foreign minister, a male person, the minister of environment, a male person, my advisor here, not exactly my idea of spending romantic for a time they wanted. We were there to discuss how these two countries can push for an Asian summit on climate change to move away from the confrontation in Copenhagen that led to the debacle. Although many diplomats tried to put their best face to it, it was a failure. We were not able to live up to our responsibilities. And I clarified, I was the only public head of state who was not there. I didn't go to Copenhagen. Because back in June, in a speech in Geneva, I had anticipated that it would fail and why it would fail. So we propose that Asia take center stage, leadership, build a consensus, an Asian consensus on climate change, sustainable development, poverty eradication, illiteracy eradication, using the resources that exist in Asia. And then invite everybody else along. A, I do not believe that there can be a binding agreement in Cancun, a binding treaty. But why it has to be always a binding treaty? Following the classic traditional models of international conferences, we always say a binding treaty. Why not a voluntary pledge by each and every country, each country saying, we are prepared to go this far. Back with money from Asia, an Asian fund to support adaptation, mitigation, reforestation, but also other related issues like poverty, illiteracy, research in renewable energy. It will be the first time that Asia take leadership center stage in an international multilateral forum in a constructive manner. This is a unique opportunity for China, for Japan, for the Republic of Korea, for India. I refer to the major Asian powers. I had discussed with Prime Minister Atoyama in Japan. This is a unique opportunity for Japan to build bridges with China, with Korea, and vice versa. Together, working with India, forge a strong Asian consensus. 
And this is part of peacemaking. Maybe through a consensus on climate change, working together on a common purpose, common agenda, facing this common challenge of climate change, we might see relations in East Asia, relations in Asia improve, and then move to the next stage, resolving border disputes and the nuclear weapons problems. Last but not least, to end my uh, comments, I cannot fail to pay tribute to all of you Cambodians coming from where I come from, a country with similar tragedy like yours. In 1975, the problems in Timor Leste began, lasting 24 years. Almost 200,000 people out of population of, at the time, less than 800,000 died in the following five years. We were a footnote of the Cold War, a footnote of history. You were a sideshow in the Vietnam War. And the tribute I want to make and what impressed me is also similar to the, the, the attitude of the people in Timor Leste. I don't know much about Cambodia. This is my third visit, and every visit has been brief, but I have read enough. In spite of the tragedy of the past, from what I've been able to read, there has not been cases of lynching, of murder, of anyone suspect with involvement in the past crimes. In meeting with so many Cambodians over the years, I have not found this profound hatred that I found in the Balkans when I was there 10 years ago, invited by the Organization of Cooperation Security in Europe to visit Bosnia. One of the most uncomfortable lectures I ever gave in my life was in Bosnia. Talking about peace, reconciliation, Oh, they were angry. I found myself to be totally out of place. I pay tribute to you, to the Cambodians, for your courage, your resilience, not in forgetting the past, because we cannot forget the past. Even smaller things that happen in our life, we cannot forget, obviously. How can we forget tragedies that fell, we fell on ourselves? We, it is Timor Leste, we do not forget the tragedies that fell on us. I come from a family that lost many brothers and sisters. And only two years ago, I almost lost my own life. Having negotiated with the rebels, and the rebels said I was the only leader in the country trusted. In the end, I was shot. But for the people of Timor, it was a turning point. The moment I was shot, all violence stopped till today. So I know what suffering is, what violence is, and that's why I pay tribute to you and to my own people. In the past 10 years since our transition from referendum to independence, eight years of independence, there has not been one single case of revenge killing. There have been killings because of land dispute, the political crisis, but nothing related to the past of Indonesian occupation, or nothing related to a conflict between people who support independence and those who oppose independence. Not a single case. And that's why I tell our people, yes, my dream of building a city of peace is realizable. Because you have shown in your heart how you are capable of forgiving even your worst enemies. I thank you. God bless you.
Dr. Jose Ramos Horner for your inspiring speech. And would now I'd like to invite you to make, remain on stage for the Q&A session. For this, I'd like to invite Dr. Tron Gilbert, Dean of Faculty of Social Science and International Relations, to moderate the sessions. Thank you, Dr. Tron.
to acquire an even stronger voice internationally. It has to be a solid organization. And to be proactive, it has to address the challenges that we face internally. And that's why we also, in the less we are very pragmatic, realistic, and we say, I said only a week or two weeks ago, in a meeting with uh, cabinet members, with our Council of State, an advisory body to the President, I said, in relation to members in ASEAN, with problems existing in ASEAN, would they want another member, in more or less, if we do not continue to consolidate peace and economically? Of course, I, if I were an ASEAN leader, I would say, politely, maybe the Istimuli should wait a bit longer. So I challenge our people, we must consolidate peace, make it a lasting permanent status of Timor, <coughs> continue to perform economically if we want to be fully integrated in ASEAN. So we challenge ourselves, because ASEAN has enough problems of winning the borders, some of the member countries. Uh, and it would be, it would, it would be unfair for us to impose ourselves in uh, circumstances that would not be uh, terribly uh, good for ASEAN. The, some of the problems exist in ASEAN, uh, countries particularly in the Philippines, in the South, uh, decades old, and uh, Southern Thailand. And some of these problems, I believe that uh, only with a lot of steady engagement, patience, can be uh, resolved. And sometimes some of us are afraid of, uh, or because we are too proud, we do not want international assistance, like international mediation. Well, in my own country, in 2006, I was only foreign minister at the time, but had a meeting with my colleagues when the problems happened in the country with the army, the police, and some people were very proud. We should not ask international assistance. And, uh, but I said, our first responsibility is not to our own time. Our first responsibility is to ensure safety, security of the people. Can we deliver that on our own? I ask the question, if we don't, then let's ask help from friends. And I, I, am, I am a patriot like anybody else on earth. But for me, sometimes I find silly some of the debate, discussions, outbursts of nationalism, uh, rejecting international mediation, or rejecting a UN presence, uh, I have uh, no difficulties with it. I have no problem seeing Australian troops, New Zealand troops, or UN police driving around the city. They are, the UN uh, police, they are the worst drivers in the world. Uh, more than once, I almost had a clash with a, a UN car coming on the direction, but that's the worst you can say. Uh, so, the problem sometimes is that when we, within our own countries, it's difficult to find people who are not involved one way or another in their conflicts. Difficult to find someone who is completely neutral. But people, the smaller the community, the more difficult to find neutral people. So, it's not uh, bad to have uh, sometimes a Norwegian a harmless Norwegian come in and help, or a, a harmless Finnish. The Indonesians, the, among the proudest people in Asia, and a few years ago, you couldn't talk about Aceh to the Indonesians. You would have an immediate emotional reaction. But then, through the mediation, first, very, very discreet work of a Geneva-based group called Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, and then later came Marty Atisari, President of Finland. They resolved the problem of watching. So some of the problems is good to have a 
international mediation, sometimes discreet, sometimes unnecessarily more visible. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. From Faculty of Education, majoring in English, TESOLs. My name is Murat, a senior student of this, fact, of this university. Well, it's a profound pleasure that I have joined this special event. It's a great pleasure for me to join this peace uh, conference. You know, as I have seen the many revolutionary uh, revolutions and conflicts throughout history, well, the problem is ha happens when people, when the gaps of the rich and the poor grow st stronger. So to me, so how could you suggest me to do and all the people in the world to do and uh, to, I mean, to bring the gap between the rich and the poor closer in order to make peace of the world? Thank you very much. Uh, before I answer uh, that, I just want to complete uh, my thought on the previous uh, issue. Uh, often, a re the reluctance of uh, the state to deal with minority problems is proportional, corresponding to the level of development of the institutions, cults of democracy in that country. Uh, the more self-confident a country is about its viability, its existence, the more it is open to uh, compromise on this. Uh, look at, uh, well, the United States is an extreme example. How many languages people speak in New York alone? Take aside the UN, people who live in Manhattan. More than 100 languages. Spanish is not yet an official language in the United States, but even politicians today want to speak Spanish because of the number of voters Spanish speaking. Does anyone in Washington, in the Congress, worry about forbidding, you know, no, they should not speak Spanish. This is an English country. No, quite the contrary, even presidential candidates want to learn Spanish to win over the Spanish voters. And why that? Well, it is a very, very confident state. Unshakable. They can afford all of these luxuries. In a smaller scale, in size, Australia. You, you have a national radio program, TV programs in numerous languages, I don't know how many languages now, addressed to minority communities in Australia. And why they do that? Because they feel overconfident. The state is solid. When we, but when he was small, vulnerable, uh, new nation state, yes, it's understandable. Leaders are more, uh, but it's a catch 22. But if you don't address the sensitivities, the feeling, the demands of a minority, well, the state will be weaker because they will fight and undermine even more the state. So that's the dilemma. Uh, the question you, uh, yes, you, refer, you are right in pointing to the gap existing between uh, emerging leaders, emerging elites in, uh, in countries. Well, that happens in most of our countries uh, around the world. What are the ways to address, to prevent that? Civil society, media, strong parliament, uh, parliamentary uh, practices where the parliament uh, do their work, their role, overse overseeing the, the uh, executive branch, where the civil society leaders speak out, media speak out on injustices, but above all, national leaders uh, give you the example of Brazil, one of, in the past at least, known as the most unequal society in the world, with extreme rich, very, very small number, and extreme poor, the largest. But under President Lula of Brazil, poverty, the population of almost 200 million in the last eight, 10 years, well, poverty has decreased by 30 to 40 million people. So under a leadership of that nature, yes, you can close the gap. It boils down to the quality of leaders. And the quality of leaders that we have depends very much on the electorate. So the final arbiters, the judges, are the people who elect us. 
in 2012, we have a new election in my own country. And it's going to be a very, very telling election because the people in 2012 in the country will judge those who today are in office. We have a, a political system whereby the president does not have executive authority. We have a more or less similar uh, system to the French, the Portuguese semi-presidential system. The government is the, the president is directly elected by the people, but separate from the parliament, separate from the government. So I do not have day-to-day -day, uh, 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 responsibilities on the conduct of the affairs of the country, except on security uh, matters, my responsibilities promote peace, security in the country, national unity, and so on. The day-to-day -day management of the country belongs to the government. And we all will be judged. My turn ends in 2012. I, at this stage at least, my mind is I will not run again, although I'm able to, under the Constitution, to run again. But I'm not terribly interested. And, uh, but those in the government, in the parliament, they all want to be re-elected. And they will be judged. And they will be judged by one important factor today. The perception of corruption, of waste, of mismanagement. And the people are very aware. So uh, they will be the judges. I hope I answered your question uh, satisfactorily. President has a very tight schedule, and we have time for only one more question. Yeah, you guys have a, a domestic issue, a uh, question. Um, have you had success in convincing people that domestic violence is a national problem, that it's an issue of civic responsibility? In the sense of that, have I convinced the people that uh, domestic violence is a national uh, problem? I don't know how, whether people have uh, this awareness now, but I do speak about it ad nauseum all the time. And I have to say, yes, it is a pervasive problem in my country. Wherever I go, in the villages, almost always I ask, is there domestic violence here? And uh, almost always the answer is yes. And sometimes I, I put a, the question differently. I ask the community leader. As I walk with him, I ask him, is there violence in this community? He says, no, we don't have violence. Only some domestic violence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it means that there are many people, and this is not an isolated answer for many, well, domestic violence is not really violence. It's just between husband and wife, or parents and kids. But for, for us, it, it is a serious problem. It's a, a national problem. And uh, both UNICEF, the United Nations in general, uh, the government, myself, we speak out again and again. There are more cases, because in the past, there were no information or no uh, mechanisms of reporting. So, uh, but now there are more frequent reports from uh, uh, women in particular to the police, to the authorities about domestic violence. One way to address this is as with time, the empowerment of the women. Because sometimes it happens that I have been witness. A, a woman goes and complains to the police. The police detain the individual concerned and he might end up in jail. But he is the only person who is earning money for the family or has a shop. And so who is going to look after the family? So that is a tragedy. And the only way is 
edu more education to the women, more empowerment of the women, not only politically but economically. And in my country, I have been very outspoken on this, and I often encourage people not to vote for male politicians. Because when you look at our history, who drag people into violence? Not women, men. And that's not only our country, I think throughout the world, throughout history. Maybe for a change, one day we should every male person in the world retire and let women run the countries. Maybe we'll have less wars. And, and one woman, very uh, a barefoot, simple, illiterate woman in one village many years ago in 201, because I never forgot her statement uh, in that meeting. And uh, he was, she was very angry with the uh, past of violence. She said, men always drag us into violence. If this continues, we will not vote for any male man for the uh, parliament. <laughs> So, but uh, I have to confess it's still uh, a big problem in my country, and I don't know whether I have it. We have a, a rich, the people in that this is a national problem. This is a national responsibility. We must stop this. Your Excellency, thank you for a very informative speech very clear answers to good questions. I also want to thank all of those who participated in the uh, events period, and thank you to the rest of you for coming. Uh, I think we all speak here a strong hand, and we move on to the next part of the program. for visiting our university, PUC. Dr. Jia San Jan Tan, PUC president, would like to present a gift to His Excellency Dr. Jose Ramos Mota. Dr. Jose Ramo Hodder, President of Timor Leste and Nobel Peace Prize Laureate and delegation now come to an end. I thank you very much for joining the program and may you have a nice afternoon.